بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الإصباح ديان الدين رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على البشير النذير السراج المنير سيد الأنام حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين الحجة ابن الحسن فداه أرواح العالمين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أطيع الله وأطيع الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Abraham Lincoln famously said about his government that this is a government of the people for the people made by the people. The government of Ali ibn Abi Talib, however, was a government for the people, of the people, but made by God. His legitimacy came from God himself. The Prophet appointed him or made the declaration on the 18th of the Hijjah and he asked all the people that participated in the, in the last pilgrimage that he performed to pledge their allegiance to Imam Ali alayhi salam. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the appointment people humans they don't have a say with respect to God's decision it's a verse in the Quran he's the creator he made the appointment and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't going to impose anything on the people. He isn't going to force anyone to pursue guidance in life. We showed him the right path and the other path that leads to deviance. You get to choose. On the one hand, it's nice because you have the option, but on the other hand, you'll be held responsible for the choices that you make. That's why you have to think twice before making a decision. Because no one is going to act on your behalf. We have heard some people say that I wish when I was younger, my father used to tell me to further my education, to enter university, I wish if my father had forced me because I didn't have the understanding back then and yet it was a choice that I made not to further my education. I wish if my father had forced me because he knew, he foresaw the future, I didn't. When it comes to religion, that's the case with religion as well. You get to choose and you will be held responsible for your actions for your deeds. That's why Amir al muminin did not nominate himself. They came to the Imam. They said, Ya Amir al muminin we want you to lead. And the Imam wanted a near consensus. He wanted the people to choose him because he wasn't going to impose anything on the people. He wants the people as a representative of God. This is how God operates. Al Imam kal Ka'bah yu'ta wa la yati. The Imam is like the Kaaba. He doesn't go chasing after people. He wants the people. He wants the people to come after him so that they would willfully want to be guided. That's how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala operates. That's why on the day of his bay'ah, 
the Imam, look at how much insight the Imam had. He looks at Talha and he says, Ya Talha, Give me your hand, I want to give you my allegiance. He said, Ya Abel Hassan, you see these people? They don't want me, they want you. The Imam said that I have fear that you might stab me in the back later on. He said, me? لا تؤتامني. I will not stab you in the back. As we mentioned, these people, they went to Basra, and the Imam, he went to Rabada, which was a city between Mecca and Medina, to meet with, with his foes, but they had already left. When they enter inside Basra, the incumbent governor of Basra, who was appointed by Amir al-Mu'mineen, a righteous man called Uthman ibn Hanif or Hunayf. The governor of Basra, with Abu Aswad al-Du'ali, another righteous companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen, they go to meet with Aisha. They tell her, Ya Aisha, what brings you to our city? She said, first of all, Ali ibn Abi Talib is ruling unjustly. His rule is illegitimate. Why? Because Uthman was killed unjustly, he was brought down, and he became the unjust heir of Uthman. That's why his rule is illegitimate. But all the people gave their allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen, and he wasn't the one that killed Uthman. Uthman was oppressed, and I'm here to avenge his blood. They tried to reason with her, but she wouldn't budge. So what she did, she went to an area called Al Mirbid, which was between uh, modern day Zubair and the old city, Basra. And it's where the battle took place later on. It's where Talha is buried today. She went there and she gave a speech. So she was actively involved in the rebellion against Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. She garnered some support. When she gave the speech, there was a disagreement between the people, but she managed to garner some support. So she came with a group of people from Mecca in the hundreds, and they had a base in Basra, and she garnered some support because she's the wife of the Prophet talking. Then she goes with Talha and Zubair to the governor's office. And they attack the governor's office, killing 500 people from Bani Abd Qais. These were the supporters of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And this was the minor uh, battle of the camel, Harb al Jamal al Sughra, that took place on that day. Some respected figures in the society, in the community in Basra, they sought a uh, ceasefire agreement be between the two opposing camps. So there was an agreement between the two. The agreement stated that the governor's office should be in the hands of the incumbent governor, Uthman ibn Hanif, and all the wealth and all the money in Baytul Mal, in the treasury, should be under his, his control as well. They signed the agreement. The only thing that the other camp had was that they had the full control of the city apart from the governor's office. After a couple of days, Talha and Zubair, they decided to ambush the governor's office and ambush the guards that were guarding the place. In the middle of the night, they attacked them. They attacked them and they slit the throat of 40 people that were guarding the, uh, the governor's office. 40 people in cold blood. There is an important uh, point that we need to address here, is that as Zubair ibn al-Awam at least, he had a, a very bright past with the Prophet. What made him change his position? And the thing is that we're not immune from the outcome that Zubair faced. Someone with this record 
fighting in defense of Islam, protecting the Prophet. And he was a loyal companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happened to him? The problem that, that he had, and we're not immune from this problem as well, is hubbu dunya the obsession with this world. This was his problem. And Amir al-Mu'mineen said, حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا رَأْسُ كُلِّ خَطِيئَةً The source for every evil is the love and attachment that we have for this world. For example, you want to be famous. You are in pursuit of fame. So you try to become famous legitimately through legitimate means. When you can't, you seek illegitimate means to become famous. It's like how these YouTube celebrities, they look for viewership. When they can't compete with other famous people, what do they do? The woman. They realize that the more they expose cleavage, they would get more viewership. So this is what they do. They make compromises and concessions on their principles and ideals just to get more viewers. Or for example, someone is in pursuit of, of uh, wealth. He tries to, to become wealthy and accumulate money through legitimate means. When they can't, they go through drugs. They you know, accumulate money through selling drugs. Why? Because all they want is money. This is what they want, whether it's through halal. If they could do it through halal means, they do it. If they can't, they do it through haram means. It doesn't matter because what they want is wealth. What they want is money. What these people wanted is they wanted government positions because they realized that when you become a president, a premier, a ruler, you would be in the limelight. You get fame. A lot of people will give you money. You get to rule. So this is what they wanted. They wanted to become governors and presidents. When they are in pursuit of such positions, that means they are obsessed with this dunya. So wherever this dunya takes them, they go. Even if they have to side with, with falsehood, and they know it, and they know it, but they go against it because they want this position. Like what we see today in the world of politics. He's, for example, uh, pro-life. He's not pro-choice. But in order for him to hold a government position, he makes concessions and compromises on his principles and ideals. He doesn't care. He wants this position. This is why they keep cha changing sides. They switch from this party to the other party just because they want this position. This is what they care about. This is what they're focusing on. This was their problem. Otherwise, a criminal is not born as a criminal. They gradually become criminals. It's like the famous story of that kid, of that guy who was about to be hanged he said, before I die, I have a message to convey. The person responsible for where I am right now is my mother. Because when I was a kid, I broke into our neighbor's home and I stole an egg. When I came back, my mother told me, MashaAllah, you've made an achievement today and started from stealing an egg. And look at me now. I am robbery. I killed people. And today I have to be hanged. So it, has, it happens gradually. These people didn't, uh, out of the blue, find themselves against Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. It happened gradually. First it was the evil intention, then defecting from Amir al-Mu'mineen, then siding with these enemies, and they gave room for the shaytan to deceive them. So they killed 40 people from the guards of the governor's office with a cold blood. They slit their throats. And they took the governor, Uthman ibn Hanif, they plucked his facial hair, his beard, his eyebrows, his, his head. They wanted to kill him, but out of fear from retribution, because his brother was the, was the governor of Medina, they had their families in Medina, they left him. And he went back to Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam. And they had full control of the city. It was a classic land grab. They conquered the city and they wanted to conquer other cities as well to bring down Ali ibn Abi Talib. In the meantime, Amir al-Mu'min traveled to Iraq. He didn't go to Kufa straight away. He went to a place called the Qar near a city called Nasiriyah, modern-day Nasiriyah in Iraq. 
This, this was where Amir al-Mu'min was positioned. And he sent Imam al-Hassan al-Mushtaba and Ibn Abbas to the city of Kufa to encourage the people to, to lend their support to the Imam. And the incumbent governor who was appointed by Uthman was Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Aisha sends a letter to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari because she knew she didn't have a chance to get any support from Kufa because the people of Kufa were with Amir al-Mu'mineen. She said, all I want you to do, to go on the pulpit and dissuade and discourage people from joining the ranks of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this is what he was doing. Imam al-Hassan would go on the pulpit, encouraging people to support his father. Abu Musa would go, discourage people from joining his, joining Amir al-Mu'mineen. Until Malik, Malik al-Ashtar came. Malik al-Ashtar was a warrior. And Amir al-Mu'mineen said about, Amir al-Mu'mineen made a statement about him. He said, كَانَ لِي كَمَا كُنْتُ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ he, he was, to me, he was like how I was to Rasulullah. This is how submissive he was. He went on the pulpit, he said, Ya Ahl al-Kufa, what are you waiting for? Hada a'lamu nasi fiqhan akhtharu nasi ilman. The first person to believe in the Prophet, the most sincere person to God, and the most loyal companion to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aren't you sick, aren't you sick and tired of the previous administrations and previous governors that came he garnered some support and he was able to galvanize close to 10,000 people to join Amir al-Mu'mineen who was positioned in the south near Nasiriya Amir al-Mu'mineen was already with 2,000 people as I mentioned last night he was with 215 from the people that gave their allegiance under the tree by Atish Shajara that's mentioned in the Quran and 80 people from the battle of Badr were all with Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. So when they join the Imam, the Imam goes to the city of Basra. He enters the city, not like con conquerors and arrogant people casting his head down, like the way the Prophet entered the city of Mecca. He was wearing a black turban, Imam al-Hasan on his right side, Imam al-Hussein on his left side, and Muhammad ibn Amir al-Mu'mineen walking in front of him. But the Imam didn't engage in a war. The Imam started to engage in negotiations with his opponents. Even though the Imam's army outnumbered the army of, of the enemies. The Imam wasn't in a weak position. And yet the Imam was concerned about the people's fate. He was concerned about the fate of Talha, Zubair, and Aisha. And because he was so concerned about them, that's why he entered into negotiations with them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't punish us. He's the representative of God, remember? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't punish us straight away when we commit a sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us first. It's like the story of Nuh. When he preached, he preached for 300 years. He would give four speeches every single day. إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ قَوْمِ لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا سِرًّا وَجَهَارًا as a speaker, I know how debilitating this is to give four speeches every day for 300 consecutive years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told him that after 300 years, I will intervene inshallah. After 300 years, these people wouldn't budge. They wouldn't believe. So he went to ask God to bring down his wrath when he meets messengers of God, angels that had come from the heavens to tell him to postpone his prayer, not to ask God to bring down his wrath. Postpone it until when? Give them 300 years. 300 more years. Let them, maybe they could change position and start to believe. He waited another 300 years. And then after 300 years, he wants to do the dua again he meets God's messengers telling him to postpone his da'wah again. Another 900 years. After 900 years, they said, you could do the du'a now. But before you do it, we want you to plant the seeds of, 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 uh, of, palm, of a palm tree. When the palm tree grows and it reaches the stage of fruition, take the wood, chop it, then create a, a, an ark, a ship, then do the du'a. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them 950 years for them to return to Him. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does to us as well. When we go astray, He doesn't punish us straight away. 
he sends us warnings. For example, he uses drugs, right? He does drug overdose. He goes into a coma. He goes to the hospital. And he's about to die. But then somehow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings him back to life. He opens his eyes. This is a wake up call for, call for him. Because if he died in that state, you would be resurrected the way you died. If he's intoxicated, if he's drugged, he would come on the day of judgment while he's drugged. He's gone, that's it, he's doomed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want this guy to die straight away. He sends him warnings. His friend dies, his mother dies. These are all wake up calls for them. And this is how Amir al Mumin operates as well. He sends a delegation after a delegation. Ibn Abbas goes, Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali goes. He sent so many people to reason with these people. Eventually Ibn Abbas goes. He talks to Aisha and she doesn't budge. Zubair who is more lenient but he's not convinced. Talha was very aggressive. He said that this is the Quran. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, let the Quran judge between us. Talha said, we can't argue with Ali. All we have for him is the sword. So he goes back to Amir al-Mu'mineen and says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, these people, they want to fight, they're adamant. Let's start the war and we'll have an advantage over them if we start the, the war and that they're not prepared. The Imam said, I would never initiate a war. And this was a tradition that the Prophet followed. Amir al-Mu'mineen followed, Imam al-Hasan followed, and Imam al-Hussein adhered by on the day of Ashura as well. I wouldn't initiate a war because I'm not here to kill. I'm here to guide. This is what brings me here. But they wouldn't budge. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he is relentless and he wants to do everything he can just to bring these people back. He doesn't want the blood of the Muslims to be shed like this. What does he do? He himself would go to talk to these people. In the world today, when there is negotiations taking place between two opposing camps, usually a person who is strong, in a strong position, wouldn't show any signs of weakness as if he's begging for negotiations. No. You would want the other side to beg for negotiations. Like what we see today happening in Singapore. But Amir al-Mu'min himself out of concern for the welfare of the Muslims and the fate of these people, he himself would go. He takes off the, his turban, he throws his sword and his shield and he walks into the battleground. Ground, into the battleground. They say, Ya Amir al-Mu'min, these people are equipped with weapons? They could, quit, they could kill you. He said, no, these people won't kill me. I know who's going to kill me. So he goes there, and then he calls out, فَلْيَخْرُجْ الزُّبَيْرِ Let the Zubair come out. Zubair comes out. He says, فَلْيَخْرُجْ طَلْحَ I want to talk to Talha as well. So Talha comes out as well. He goes so close to them that history tells us that the necks of the horses were, uh, they, they were neck to neck, as if they're hugging each other. So the Imam looks at Zubair and he says to him, Ya Zubair, do you remember when one day the Prophet told you, do you like Ali? You said, of course I like him, he's my cousin. Do you remember what the Prophet told you? He said, Kayfa bik? What if one day you will rise against him unjustly? You will be the oppressor, the aggressor. He said, me Ya Rasulullah, would I ever do that? He said, yes. It happened twice. Once when he was returning from Ibn Auf's house and one when I returned from the war. Do you remember that? He said, yes, you reminded me now of that incident. He said, Ya Zubair, Ya Talha, you know very well that the Prophet cursed the people of the camel. They are doomed. He said, but we have the glad, glad tidings of from the Prophet that we're going to paradise. The Imam said, where? How? He said, what Sa'id ibn, ibn Zayd reports, he narrated that he heard the Prophet say, 10 people are going to paradise, al-ashra al-mubashara. And I'm one of them. The Imam said, could you name them? He said, yes, of course. And he started listing the names of the people included in the, in the hadith. 
But he did, he did mention the 10th person. The Imam said, and who's the 10th person? He said, you. He said, so you admit that I'm going to paradise, right? According to this quote unquote hadith. He said, yes. The Imam said, but I will not give you the admission that you're going to paradise. This is a fabricated hadith. And let me tell you something. Some of the people that you mentioned in this hadith, they will be in the deepest pit in a valley in the inferno, in a casket, and every time God wants to reignite the inferno, He would open that casket. And the irony here is that the person that reports the hadith, Sa'id ibn Zayd, one day he came and he was the only one that heard, heard the Prophet say that. He came to the Muslims and he said, I give testimony that I heard the Prophet say 10 people are going to paradise. And he named nine people. Then he said, do you want to know who's, who's the 10th? They said, yes. He cried and said, Sa'id ibn Zayd. When you're part of that list, you know something is fishy. So Amir al said, this is a fabricated lie. You don't have any guarantees from the Prophet. How could the Prophet give you guarantees when you can change your positions in life? You're not immune. Then the Imam said to him, look, let's dismiss all of that. Didn't you and Talha willfully give your allegiance to me? He said, yes. So the Imam said, عرفتني في الحجاز أنكرتني في العراق فما عدا مما بدا You know me in, in, in Hijaz, but now you don't know who I am, now that we're in Iraq. Did I oppress you? Did I wrong you? Did I do anything to you? He said, that's it. And he decided to uh, not join in that war, to leave. Then he looked at Talha, the Imam. He said to him, Ya Talha, can I ask you a question? Did you bring your wife to this war? He said, no, I left her in Medina. He said, don't you think you didn't do justice to the Prophet? You brought the wife of the Prophet with you while you kept your wife in a safe, safe place in Medina. While the Quran says, when you want to talk to them, to the wives of the Prophet, you have to talk to them behind the veil. And he said, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ They should leave their house, houses. Zubair goes back to the army and he says that I decided to leave. Aisha uses reverse psychology with him. She said, you chickened out, of course. You're fearful of Ali. You're scared of Ali. You're not the only one. A lot of people are scared from the sword of Ali. He said, no. Zubair was known for his bravery. Then his son Abdullah ibn Zubair, who was a wicked man, a wicked man. Imam Ali says, لا زال الزبير منا أهل البيت. Zubair was one of us, the progeny of the Prophet, until his son grew up. Abdullah ibn Zubair. He was a person that wouldn't say, Allah صلى على محمد وآل محمد, saying that because Muhammad has relatives that would become proud when they hear the name of their relative Muhammad. So I wouldn't say, Allah صلى على محمد وآل محمد. So he said, الجبن الجبن. Yes, you're scared. You're scared from Ali ibn Abi Talib. He wants to prove them wrong. He unsheathed his sword, charged at the, charged at the army of Imam Ali alayhi salam, 12,000 people. He charged at them. Imam Ali said, Utrukuh, ufruju lahu fa innahu mu'ayyar. Give room for him to make this maneuver because they're making fun of him. So he came in the middle of the Imam's army and he instilled his, his spear in the ground. Then he comes back. I am Jaban? No, I'm not Jaban. Then his son comes up to him and says, Ya. Yeah, Oh, Dad, you were the one that ignited this war. You created this war. Now you're leaving? What will the Arabs say? So Zubair said that I made a vow. He said, well, you can pay kafara. He said, okay, then I'll free my, my slave uh, Makhul as a kafara and rejoin the army. But Amir Mu'min would leave him. Amir Mu'min came back again to talk to him. He convinced him. Eventually, he left the army. But Talha and Aisha were adamant. They started shooting the Imam's army with their arrows. Amir al-Mu'mineen then gave a speech to his companions, to his army. He said, look, if we engage in this war, you only fight the people that fight you. If you see someone running away, you wouldn't chase them. If you see an injured person, you wouldn't touch them. 
If you see women and children, you do not touch them. Even if the woman insulted you, assaulted you, you wouldn't touch them. You wouldn't, you wouldn't enter inside the people's houses because they were in the middle of the city. Ethics of war. But the Imam wouldn't start, wouldn't engage, even though they're shooting them. The Imam said one last resort. So he said, who is willing to get up unarmed, go to these people and tell them that let the Qur'an be the judge between us. The Qur'an speaks about this incident. وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا So one man stands up, a young guy. The Imam said, if you go, they're going to kill you. He said, Asbir. But the Imam disregarded his remark. Then he again said, who's willing to go? The same guy got up. He said, they're going to kill you. He said, I don't care. Then for the third time, he said, I'm going to go, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Look at the, the amount of courage that this young guy had to muster to make such a stance. Look at how these people were tested and look at us today. Look at us today. When we need to display patience, we don't. And the Prophet said that the relationship between patience and Iman is like the relationship between our head and the body. You don't have patience, you're not a mu'min. With respect to hijab, with respect to the sexual desire, with respect to treating other people, we need to display patience, practice patience. He goes to the people unarmed, he takes the, the Qur'an high up for everyone to see, he delivers the message, Aisha says, stone him, attack him, qabbahahullah. So they attack him with their spears, he is killed, his mother comes, she was there, she witnessed everything. She goes on his body and she, begin, she begins to wail. Then they showered the Imam's army with arrows. They said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, should we give them our necks to kill, them, to kill us? So Amir al-Mu'mineen was then when he said, Bismillah wa Billah. He gave the standard to his son Muhammad ibn al Hanafiyyah, And because him and his children would be in the forefront. He wouldn't let the Muslims fight for him. He has to be in the forefront. He gave him the raya, which was the, the standard of Rasulullah. And he said to him, this is a raya. La turad wa lan turad abada. Anyone who has this standard will become victorious. And then he got the shield of Rasulullah while riding on the mule of Rasulullah as shahba. Then he engaged. Wa kana muharwilan. He would walk hastily and not slowly even though he is faced with an entire army. He would only strike once. He doesn't need to strike twice. These are some of the descriptions that we have. And every time he wants to strike someone, he says, Take it and I am Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they wouldn't see, because he, he would do it so quick and fast, he, they wouldn't see blood stain on his sword. A lot of things happened in that war, but the epicenter of the war was the camel of Aisha. It was a source of inspiration for them. They would seek blessing from that camel, from the urine of the camel, from the waist of that camel, and anyone that wanted to fight would first go to the camel and take the, the, the rein of the camel and then would engage. A man by the name of Ka'b ibn Sur, who was a, a tribal leader, he was reciting while revolving around the camel, Ya ma'ashara al-azd alaykum ummakum fa innaha salatukum wa sawmukum. Our religion is now summarized in the mother of the believers, Aisha. We should protect her. And people were getting killed. According to some historians, 12,000 people, 12, people were killed. Others say the figure is higher than that, 30,000 people. Some say 15,000 people, 5,000 from the army of Amir al-Mu'mineen and 10,000 from the army of Aisha. Some people say it took the, the war, uh, it just took them half a day or one day for the war to unfold. And some say it took them three days to engage. Amir al-Mu'mineen eventually said, that if the, if the camel is killed, as I mentioned one night, this will extinguish the fire. So Imam al-Hasan Mushtaba goes and he kills the camel that was being 
carried on the shoulders of four people because he was in the middle of the war. It was, a, it was a fierce battle. So his right hand and left hand were, were severed and his right leg and, and left leg were also severed. So four people were carrying the camel. The Imam al-Hassan managed to strike a spear in the thorax of the camel. It fell. When the camel fell, Aisha straight away said, who killed the camel? They told her that it was al-Hassan ibn Ali. So she held grudge against Imam al-Hassan. When Imam al-Hassan was poisoned to death, he was about to be buried near his grandfather, she came out saying that you're not burying someone that I don't like in my house. So she prevented him from being buried next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. So you know what happened and what was the answer to what incident. Anyway, when the camel fell and people scattered, and this brought an end to the war. Amir al-Mu'mineen quickly ordered Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the half-brother of Aisha, the son of Abu Bakr, who was in the army of Amir al-Mu'mineen, to go and to see if his sister Aisha is okay. And to guard her, to protect her. So he goes there, he removes the tent of the Mahmil. She, she said, who are you? He said, Akhuki wa abghavun nas ilayki. I am your brother and someone that doesn't like you, that detests you. She said, Muhammad, I'm glad that you're safe. He said to her, are you sure? Because you wanted to win in this war. In the Mahmal, when she was in the Mahmal, she would say things. She would encourage people to fight. She would, she would say, anyone who is willing to bring me the head of this bold guy, referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib. She wanted to win in that war. And your win had to happen on my dead body. So you wanted me to die. She said, now that the war is over, I'm happy that you're safe. And we'll let God judge between us. He said, God? Were you following the Quran when you left your home? Even though the verse says, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ God? And then Amir al-Mu'mineen came. When the Imam came, he said, Ya Aisha, ahakadha amaraki rabbuki. Is this what God ordered you to do? She said, Malakta fa'asjah. Now that you became victorious, just pardon. The Imam said, You don't have to tell me. Qad fa'alt. I already did. Not only Aisha, all the key players, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Talha was killed. By whom? By Marwan, who was in his army. When they were about to lose, he said, by God, the killer of Uthman is none other than Talha. He shot him with an arrow. And Talha realized that the arrow came from behind. So he said that this arrow came from a person in our army. But all the others that were alive, the Imam pardoned them. He didn't even imprison them. Zubair, uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and Marwan ibn al-Hakam. But the Imam said, When I am oppressed, I have to be patient. When I become victorious, I have to show clemency. And pardon, pardon them. And then the Imam says this statement. He said, The best way to please God is through suppressing your anger. Is through clemency when you're angered. This put an end to this war. And the Imam sent 40 women to protect her when he sent her back to the holy city of Medina. Amr ibn al-As, later on, he met with Aisha. He said to her, O oh, mother of the believers, I wish if you were killed in that battle. She said, why la abalak? La abalak is a phrase used when you want to say someone is born out of wedlock and no one know, knows who his father is. Abu ibn Asf, he was the son of Asa ibn Wa'il, who is mentioned in Surah Al Kawthar, and Nashani'aka huwa al Abtar. God is saying about him that he is impotent. He can't, he can't impregnate, a, impregnate a woman. So he shouldn't have, a, 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 he shouldn't have a children according to God. And somehow, the miracle baby, Amr ibn al-As was conceived, so he is attributed to As ibn Wa'il. So she said, why la abalak? He said, if you were killed, first of all, you would become a martyr and go to paradise. Secondly, we could use that against Ali. He killed the mother of the believers. The Imam put an end to this war, but he ordered his companions not to touch anything, no war booties, no disrespect to anyone, no revenge killing, nothing, nothing, nothing. But brothers and sisters in Karbala, even though Amir al-Mu'mineen's advice to his soldiers was, was not to touch the woman, 
But what happened to Lady Zainab? When she came to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, عزيز علي أن أراك على الثراء عزيز عليك أن ترى اليوم ما بيا يا أبا عبد الله there are foreigners standing here there are no mahram standing here otherwise I would show you my body and how my body is turned blue because of all the lashes, because of all the whips. It garrabit liyah, it garrabit liyah. Sema'at yuwin, it garrabit liyah. Athar al-walimit was-sididi. وشفت ألف سبعمية جرح بيح يا جرح داوي ويا جرح خلي I saw so many wounds in his body which of his wounds should I cure should I heal which should I leave قالها يا زيان بكل جرح بعضا يخلي يحبس جرح لب قلبي خلي عينك علي جياتك جياتك يا خو يا فاقد الراي I am bewildered though أبا عبد الله جياتك يا خو يا فاقد الراي 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 ومن الضرب تتراجع فعضا You don't know how much these people attacked us ومن الضرب تتراجع فعضا جيتك علي عداي توما يقولون ها يخت الذبيح الما شرب ما قال ها يا زيانب يا زيانب يا زيانب عندي لج وصية تمشين للطاغي السبية من تمشين للطاغي السبية خلي عينك على بنيتي رقية أي أي خلي عينك على بنيتي أي 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 رقية يا حمى الضاعنات بعدك ضعنات 